God's Word brings people to faith, it enables people to grow in faith, and it encourages people in turn to share their faith. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. Christianity is about the wonder of what Christ has done. He loved you before the dawn of time. The answer to our broken world is found only one place, at the cross of Jesus Christ. The believers in Ephesus came from different backgrounds, both ethnically and socially. And the miracle of it was that God had saved them and made them one. And they were indwelled by one Spirit, uh, the Spirit that, was at, that is at work within their lives as individuals having quoted 1 Corinthians 3 uh, in terms of the plural you in 1 Corinthians 6, which some of you are immediately thinking of. There it is in the singular. Yes, it is. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. He's addressing the individuals there in terms of the call to holiness and to purity. And he uses the same picture. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Therefore, it is incongruous that you would engage in these things, because you are a holy temple to the Lord. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is is what constitutes you a, a, a church together, he says. And it is incongruous, then, that there would be disunity when he is the one who unites us. And the work of the Holy Spirit actually produces the same fruit in uh, everybody's life. If you think about it, it's quite remarkable. Uh, The gifts differ, but the fruit doesn't. So if you meet Chinese Christians, and they are growing in Christ, uh, you will find that the fruit of the Spirit is in evidence, articulated in Chinese, but lived out in the reality of everyday life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and so on. All of these things are expressed, no matter where you go in the world, in the body of Christ, whether the person is intelligent or not so smart whether they are uh, from uh, Asia or from North America. It is the Spirit of God who does this, because there is only one body, and there is only one Spirit. Now, the unifying factor in that is absolutely crucial. Uh, You know, I try to write down for myself, just trying to think of it, uh, what, what would be true then, no matter where you go amongst the people of God. And I just had five C's. And I think I may have mentioned them this morning, but I, I wasn't looking at them. In fact, I hadn't reached this page in my notes. So that, so that as a result of the Spirit's work in the lives of individuals uh, and His work within the context of the church, those who are in this body are those who have been convicted of the fact of their sinfulness, that they were without God and without hope in the world, that they were dead in their trespasses and in their sins. And nobody is a, is, is a genuine Christian who believes that uh, it makes perfect sense that God would have included them, because they've never really done very much wrong at all, and they're eminently nice people. That individual has never understood the gospel, because the gospel brings us to our knees. The gospel brings us down before it lifts us up. So they have been convicted. They have at the same time been convinced of the work of Jesus and of the necessity of the work of Jesus uh, in their lives. As a result of that, they have been, in turn, converted, so that there has been a transformation in their lives. As we said this morning, it may have been dramatic, it may have been slow, it may have been gradual, it may have been instantaneous from a human perception. Uh, The work of God's grace uh, is mysterious in, in every dimension. Nevertheless, converted, and then being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that no matter where you go in the world, when you meet the people of God, what's happening to them, the same thing that's happening to you. Whether you're learning it in Arabic or in Chinese or in, uh, in Hindustani, it doesn't matter. What you're learning as one who has been included in Christ's body is that the work of the Spirit of God is to conform you to the image of His Son. So convicted, convinced, converted, conformed, and all in communion— the communion that is brought about as a result of the Spirit's work unifying those who are in Jesus. It's quite wonderful, isn't it? The same fruit that is produced in Cairo is produced in Cleveland. Uh, The same fruit produced in Detroit is produced 
in Delhi. And whatever our personalities or whatever our nationalities, we are animated and united by the one Spirit, by the one Holy Spirit. Now, when— and I want to just make a slight pause here purposefully again. When we talk here about the work of the Holy Spirit, and when we recognize that the Spirit of God is at work, and the Lord Jesus is at work, and God the Father is at work, and so on, we recognize that the, pros the process here, as it is outlined, is not in the normal manner of our terminology. Uh, in other words, uh, you will see that uh, the work of the Holy Spirit comes first, and then the mention of Jesus comes next, and then the place of God the Father comes afterwards. I'm going to mention that in just a moment in relationship to our what is our second word and our final point, namely the hope. But when we think in terms of the Trinity, which is what we're introduced to here, we have to recognize that we're dealing with something that actually boggles the mind, that at best what we have in the Bible is um, not an explanation of the truth of the doctrine of the Trinity, but a formulation of its truth. You have, for example, in the baptism of Jesus in Matthew, uh, you have each member of the, the, the Godhead uh, present and active simultaneously. That's very, very important, because one of the heresies that developed in the church was called Sabellianism or modalism. And what it taught was that God appeared in different modes at different times. So some, sometimes he took on the form of the Father, sometimes he came as the Son, and another time he came as the Spirit. And the early fathers of the church said, this cannot possibly be. And one of the places that they looked for the simultaneous activity of each member of the Trinity was, of course, in the baptism of Jesus. The voice comes from heaven of the Father. This is my beloved Son. The Son is in the water, and the Holy Spirit alights upon him as a dove. Now, when you go through your Bible, uh, you will be struck by this. You're not going to find a place in the Bible that says, here is the doctrine of the Trinity. And when you read your Bible, you will, you will gradually put the jigsaw together with the help of the Holy Spirit. For example, uh, when Paul is writing in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 8 concerning paganism and idols and idol worship, in that context, this is 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6, he says, uh, there is one God, the Father, for whom are all things and for whom we exist. All right? There is one God, the Father. When you read John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John says uh, that the Word is God. When you come to uh, the uh, encounter uh, with Ananias and Sapphira, where uh, they are confronted by their lying, and Peter tells them uh, that they have lied to the Holy Spirit, and then he follows that up by saying, you have not lied to men, but to God. So, uh, wh what's happening here? Are these, are these individuals disagreeing with one another? No. They're simply putting the pieces of the puzzle together for us. So that the, the revelation is of one God who is three persons, a revelation which is in the Scriptures, which is hard to understand, which is even more difficult to explain, and yet which is a fundamental part of basic Christian doctrine. Before I leave the Spirit, let me say something else again. And that is that we began the service with essentially a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, dwell here among us. Is that legitimate to ask? Uh, surely we gather in uh, the presence of Jesus, the risen presence of Jesus. We know the risen presence of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So then is it legitimate for us to ask him to come? Well, I think the answer to that is, not only is it legitimate, but it's absolutely necessary. 
And we will see before we finish Ephesians that Paul is going to urge the Ephesians to make sure that they go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, that their encounter with the Holy Spirit will be an ongoing one, a progressive one, and an obvious one. And when you read the Acts of the Apostles, you see that that is actually the case that uh, all that happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, actually you discover happening all over again in Acts chapter 4. When you get to the eighth chapter of Acts, in Samaria and in Caesarea and in the household of Cornelius, you have this great move of the Holy Spirit. You have it again in Acts chapter 19. If you trace church history, as I mentioned this morning, out of the Dark Ages, what was the great need in the, out of the Dark Ages? As the, as the light of the gospel was virtually extinct. What was the great need? It was for the Holy Spirit to come. It was for the Holy Spirit to come in revival. And there is no question but that the Reformation was as a result of God coming to revive his work in the midst of the years, so that out of all of that deadness and darkness and emptiness, suddenly the light shines. Suddenly the Bible comes to life. Suddenly you have this amazing proclamation of the gospel. What has God done? He has come by the Holy Spirit. You have the same thing in the 18th century. And what is quite remarkable about it is that this comes as a result of the sovereign purpose of God. It's not engineered. It can't be engineered. Uh, when I came to America and I heard, I went places and they said, would you speak at our revival? I said, absolutely not. How can you have a revival? Well, you can't have a revival. You can have a, a teaching session. You can have an evangelistic endeavor, but you can't, quote, have a revival. By definition, a revival is something that God does spontaneously, and it comes virtually out of nowhere. That's why in the 18th century, 1734, Northampton, Massachusetts, Jonathan Edwards, whoa! The very next year, Daniel Rowland and Howell Harris, an ocean away in Wales, and the Holy Spirit comes. 1736 and 37, George Whitfield. 1738, John and Charles Wesley. Suddenly, into the 19th century, the same thing. And the unifying factor in it is that it exalts Christ, it is vital, it is energetic, it is organic, and it is only produced by God, the Holy Spirit. In eternity, what we've got an inkling of in reading church history will become apparent. And the stories seem almost too quaint to be realistic. But history records that, for example, in the revivals in the Outer Hebrides of Britain, when the historians tried to trace it back, who started this? Where did this come from? It came finally to the home of two elderly sisters who, unbeknown to anyone, had covenanted before God to pray that the Spirit of God would come and revive the work of God in their generation. And he did. What does our nation need more than any other thing? It needs revival. It needs a revival that comes in the people of God, in the people of God, taking that which is becoming routine, familiar, dull, absorbable, moribund, and transforming it. When Gypsy Smith was asked about revival, as I've told you before, they said, well, how do you pray for revival? He said, I take a piece of chalk, I draw a circle on the ground, I stand inside the circle, and I ask God to revive everything inside the circle. Now, you take it. If everybody at Parkside Church gets your own metaphorical piece of chalk, draws a circle, steps in, and covenants from this day forward, revive me, revive me, revive my heart, increase my interest in the things of God. Make me diligent for your truth. Help me not to be this and that and the next thing. Can you imagine what may happen, what God may choose to do? For there's only one body, because there is only one Spirit. And it is in that sense that there is this one hope, and it is the hope to which you have been called with your calling. 
He's mentioned this all the way from the beginning, hasn't he? That he has called, called us. I love that uh, the, the Christian song that we sing to the tune of uh, O oh Danny Boy. That we, what does it begin again? What grace is mine that he who dwelt in highest bliss called through the night to something my something soul. I can't remember. But he called through the night. And in that calling, called as a result of the work of the Spirit of God into a hope, to a faith, to a baptism that is again on account of the fact that there is one Lord. Now, we'll come to that later, but let me remind you again that the order is worthy of note. The work of the Holy Spirit, which is where it begins, is on account of the sending of the Lord Jesus. Remember, Jesus says to his disciples in the Upper Room Discourse, when the Counselor comes, when the Counselor comes, and he, the Father, sends the Spirit, the Son sends the Spirit, and the Spirit comes. The promise of Jesus, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the person and work of Jesus is ours on account of the sending of the Father. You will notice, actually, that the, that, that the Father, the Father does, nobody sends the Father. The Father sends the Son. The Father sends the Spirit. And Jesus says, uh, later on we'll see, that he ascended on high and he gave gifts uh, to uh, those who were his own in the sending of the Holy Spirit. So that what God has accomplished in the work of the Son, he has applied in the life of the believer by the Holy Spirit, and he hasn't finished yet. You were, Paul says to the Ephesians previously, without God and without hope in the world, but now you have been born anew to a hope that is a living hope. And as Dan pointed out for us last Sunday morning, uh, the word hope here is used in Romans 5, as well as in this context, is the anticipation of an unrealized, yet nevertheless certain, promise. It is not a hope that it may or may not. It is the certainty that it will. And in Romans 5, the hope does not put us to shame. In Romans 8, a hope that is seen cannot be a hope. In Romans 12, we rejoice in hope. In Romans 15, in his benediction, may the God of hope do all these things for you. And when he writes to the Thessalonians concerning the inquiries that had come his way about those who had died, who had fallen asleep in Jesus, he said, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who sleep, which is a metaphor for death, which is one of the reasons why I don't like cremation. There's not a lot of sleeping going on there. Those who sleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. Who have no hope. It's an amazing thing. I mean, you can't live without hope. People cannot live without hope. And the ultimate hope is the hope that is found in the gospel. I, I wrote this week to a gentleman that I don't know personally, although I know he knows us and he knows the ministry here. I think I may have met him at Camp of the Woods on one occasion, but someone let me know that his wife had died quite suddenly, and she had contracted cancer, and it had taken her very quickly. And um, I had known that she and he had previously lost a 14-year-old son in a skiing accident. And so, uh, realizing where he is in his pilgrimage at the moment, I, along with many others, I'm sure, decided to drop him a note. And in the course of the note, and it was a brief note, it was a kind of uh, William Cowperish note, um, in the sense that God moves in a mysterious way, that he plants his footsteps in the sea, that we ought not to um, try the Lord by feeble sense. Uh, that it is deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, all, all of that. But ultimately, I wanted to remind him that we are assured of the reality of the resurrection, that uh, 
Christ has triumphed over death and triumphed over the grave. And the distinguishing features of Christian experience uh, take us to the very depths of our predicament and show us that Christ is triumphant. You see, as we think about life and as it goes by, I said to my wife as I crawled into bed last night, I said, this getting old stuff is starting to really bug me. <laughs> yeah, I think she said, you know, you're referring to me. I said, no, 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 no. I'm referring to me. Because, because I'm a, now, now, now I am the age of my grandfather. I mean, I just came from Glasgow. I was going to tell you about that, but it doesn't matter. But I came from Glasgow. I'm like uh, three months away from being able to ride the buses for free. Just, I'm actually going to fly to Glasgow just to ride the bus for nothing, just so I can get on. But it comes at a price. It comes at the price of the fading of your earthly grasp of things, the diminution of your everythings, right? And when you think about it, without to live without God, as revealed in Jesus, who dealt with our sin, who triumphed over the grave, is to live in absolute hopelessness. Hence, the kind of cynical bumper sticker. Life is tough, and then you die. That's it. And the people look on, and they say, you Christians with your pie in the sky when you die stuff. We're not talking about pie in the sky when we die. We're talking about having been brought into the reality of this in the present tense, that because of the work of God, we have understood what it means to be united to Jesus, to be included in his body, to be instructed, filled, guided, enabled, kept by the work of the Holy Spirit, and to be able to say, this hope stands the test of time. When we do funeral services, and we say the words of committal, I know that it sounds in Congress, for as much as it has pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to receive unto himself the soul of this dear one here departed, we therefore commit their body to the ground, ashes to ashes and dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our earthly body, that it may be like unto his glorious body, according to the mighty working whereby he has been able to subdue all things, even death, unto himself. This is the Christian's hope. And he or she who has this hope reveals it, not by being able to articulate the details of eschatology, but by two things, by a zealous, energetic desire to see other people coming to know the Lord Jesus, and by a commitment to moral purity. First John 3, he who has this hope within him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. It's wonderful. It is truly wonderful. Father, thank you how wonderful it is. Our minds cannot comprehend the vastness of your dealings with us, that from all of eternity you purpose this, that chosen before the foundation of the world, who can understand this? Thank you that you bring us into a realm that is filled with hope, and not on account of our ability to engineer it, but rather to enjoy it. 
And we pray, Lord, that you will uh, so quicken us in this respect. So come and answer our opening prayer, Holy Spirit, so that Jesus may be all the more precious to us individually and as a church, so that you will revive us. How, how, how will that look? Whatever way you want it to look. But we earnestly pray to that end. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.